What's God do? He asks Noah to build this. Like, what do you think Noah's reaction was when he's like, I want you to build this thing. And he sees these dimensions. He's like, what? Like, there's no way he's like, oh, no problem. Right. And I often feel, I mean, I'm, this may be a little Sunday school, but I, I often feel that in my life. Like all of a sudden you're walking with God, you're doing this thing. And then you feel like you're supposed to do this thing. That's like, what? Like, what's going on here? Why, why? This doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't understand this. And I think that it, the story reaffirms to me, like when you are a tree in the forest, the forest doesn't make any sense. But that's where faith has to come in and just remind you of this ing- ginormous story that Noah was a part of. And guess what? You and I are a part of the same story today. It's still progressing. Well, welcome, everybody. Jeremiah and I are continuing our discussion Uh, on the podcast series, Meet God. And we are talking about God and many of his characteristics. And we are also discussing important things about God, including why he created us and his desire to create a relationship with us. Uh, How and when he decided to live among his people his plans for his current and future kingdom, and his desire to have us be the people of God. So each one of these themes, major themes, helps us to learn a little bit more about God. And we started with a very fascinating, interesting dive into the Adam and Eve story, the story of creation. And that was awesome, wasn't it, Jeremiah? Absolutely. I mean, the the thing that I uh, go back to is what you and I talk about in our prep of this of, I don't know if Genesis is a book you're going to pick up just for fun. It's, mm-hmm. it's just, it's a wild, wild story. But when there's a reason to pick it up, it's always refreshing to me of how it makes me ask questions to God of like, what's going on here? And it always reveals pieces of his character to me or reminds me of pieces of his character in my day-to-day life. So the Adam and Eve story as um, foundational and as hard as it is to process, I think it's just good to be reminded of, of what we were created to be, which is to worship God, work with mm-hmm. God, be a part of God's kingdom, um, uh, work to further his plans for the earth and ourselves. Uh, that's what we were built for. And then we walked away from it. Um, and I, you know, again, we can all relate to Adam and Eve. We've all walked away from our responsibilities and the good things of our life. I, I, th- I agree with all of that. But moving from Adam and Eve, um, we're going to now discuss the story of the next man who God raises up, sort of the Adam replacement, the first Adam replacement, a man called Noah. So to put some context into this, I want to say that the world, according to the Hebrew Bible, was created in 3751 BC. This is according to the Hebrew calendar. So human beings lived with God, but this had changed when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Now humans were cast out of the Garden of Eden and they were living on their own. And they could not themselves restore the relationship with God. It was broken. Only uh-huh. God could restore that relationship. And it's interesting because we can tell that God already has plans in mind for how to restore that relationship. But the fact is that the consequence of the fall, it was huge. It's much greater than we give it credit for because we just have this imagery of, you know, Adam and Eve eating the apple and then being thrown out of the garden. It impacted humanity for all times all the way up until today. So the consequences were big. And we can point to the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4 as the first murder, like the introduction Mm -hmm. of murder into human lives. Um, I want to share a quote from a great scholar, a person I greatly admire, N.T. Wright. And he has this to say about the aftermath of the garden catastrophe. When they acquired, what they acquired was not a neutral knowledge, 
but the knowledge of good and evil as an oppressive power that now worked within them, causing shame, fear, and ultimately death. So we can look at these words that describe our current state of being, separation from God, judgment, curses, shame, fear, and death. So the effect of this sin of Adam and Eve, it was immediate and it was oppressive and it was huge. A very big thing happened. <clears throat> now, 15 centuries after Adam and Eve, God came to regret that he had made humans at all. He was deeply troubled. And this imagery is so striking to me to think of our creator being deeply troubled and regretting making us. Now, he didn't make a mistake, but he regretted what had happened with humankind and the introduction of sin. In Genesis 6, 5, it tells us this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. So this kind of indicates to us that human depravity had come to such a point that every thought and intention was corrupted and that evil was pervasive everywhere and it was continuous. So what did God do about this reality of what was happening with people? And that is our next story, the story of God and Noah. But let's just stop for a minute and kind mm -hmm. of digest what we learned about what happened after Adam and Eve and their departure, their exile, expulsion from the garden and what came next. Yeah, I mean, you, we, we skipped over it and, and we could spend a whole podcast series on the, the nuances of that story of what happened with Cain and Abel, what happened subsequently after that. Um, and I, I think it's we can get into the theology of did God, uh, why did he come to regret this? Did he not know this was going to happen? And I think part of these things have used reminded me of through the course of this story of take the story at face value what does that mean, right? What are we going to extract from that? And it basically means there's a separation from us, God. We have bad hearts. Like I thought that line that you just read, um, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. I don't think that's just then, right? That feels very similar to now. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you've watched any news recently, but... <laughs> A little, yes. You know, there's the, it, it, it sounds a lot like that. Like, uh, uh, I think if you watch the news, you could easily have the thought of um, that every inclination of thought in the human heart was only evil all the time, right? Yeah. Um, so it clearly lays out the problem. And then God comes to a solution for this. Uh, and then he weighs it out. Um, and so walk me through that, that weighing out part. Like he, he, he clearly is dissatisfied with us. He's very dissatisfied and he sees what's in the heart of humans. He sees their nature, their character, their intent, and what he sees is not good. He is not seeing the good. He's only seeing the evil because that is all he can see. But he does have something in mind, um, it's both negative and positive. And what he has in mind is to basically destroy all living creatures on the planet. He's mm -hmm. had his fill, if you will. And so we're gonna talk about the story of how one man changes that, how one man is able to redeem humankind. Um, because one man found favor with God and that is Noah. Now, he was living the life that God intended for his people because he chose to walk with God. So, mm -hmm. But it wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't mm -hmm. a sinless man. But he was 
different from the rest, and Noah found favor with God, and this is detailed in Genesis 6, 9. So who is Noah? Noah lived in Mesopotamia, which is, of course, the cradle of civilization, and he was born around 2948 BC. And at the time when God called Noah, he was 500 years old. People lived much longer then. And he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. And his sons were married, so he had sons and daughter-in-laws. So as I said, God wanted this radical reset, a cleansing judgment. Because of his justice, he couldn't allow humans to continue to perpetuate with evil at the core of them for all time. And he said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people. Uh, I'm going to surely destroy both people and the earth. And while God is saying this to Noah, he's also following that up with, by the way, Noah, I want you to build a boat <laughs> so that I can spare you. So we have this bit of a dichotomy in the message. I want to destroy creation. And yet, Noah, I'm going to give you the, the, the challenging job of saving humanity because you are righteous. Now, God gives Noah extensive, extensive plans on how to build an ark. And this is a certain uh, boat, if you will. The word ark is only used one other time in the Bible, and that is when it describes the little basket that, Noah, that Moses was in, which was also called an ark. Yes. I was just going to ask, uh, now there is the Ark of the Covenant. There was also Ark was, was used, right? Or is there a translation thing there? There's probably a difference in that meaning, and okay. we'll have to, we would have to explore that. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, Ark with Moses, Ark with Noah has the same, uh, it has the same, I don't know, meaning, because it's, it's something that saves people. It, it, it keeps them from drowning. It, it's a saving mechanism. So anyway, the ark was not a small boat. You know, it's about 450 feet long. It's 75 feet wide. It's 45 feet high. Um, if you compare this to a modern cruise ship, which I did, uh, something like the celebrity cruise boat is typically a thousand feet long. So twice the size of a cruise ship, I'm certain much shorter as well. Uh, for you football fans, it's whatever. The average football field is 360 feet. So if you're looking down at a football field, Noah's Ark would be a bit beyond it, but that gives you some measure of how to think about the size of this boat. Now, in the in the story, we see that Noah obeys God's instructions and he builds the ark. This was not an easy job to do. It wasn't an easy task and it took a very long time. He started it when he was 500 years old. He went into the boat when he was 600 years old. So a hundred years to build this boat, a hundred or so years. Um, that's a long period of time in our way of thinking and our understanding of time. <clears throat> but it is during this time that God continues to extend his grace over the earth. He's still allowing people and animals to live, even though he had passed judgment on them. And it's between his judgment and the, start, the starting period of the flood. So... Noah does exactly what God wants him to do, and God says to him, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. And he establishes the covenant with Noah once the whole flood and everything is over. But this is an important theme, this idea of a covenantal relationship with God, and this is the first covenant he made specifically with a man. So the boat gets done. And Noah fills it with his children and his daughter-in-laws and his wife. All together, there are eight people on the boat. And then, as we all know from our childhood days and nursery rhymes and everything else, a whole bunch of animals, you know, 
the, the pairs of animals in order to make certain that they survive what's going to happen. Uh, anything that had the breath of life was represented on the ark. Yeah. Now, once they were all in the boat, God shuts them in. I love that language. I love the fact that it sounds like God is, uh, it, it shows that God is involved in this plan. He shuts them in the boat and then the flood waters happened and it wasn't just rain. It was also the waters from the ocean expanding so that the entire earth was covered with flood waters. Now, uh, this would have been quite an unbelievable scene to have be in the boat and see this taking place. But this is what the Bible, this is what Genesis tells us happened, that it covered the entire earth. Um, and they lived on this boat for more than a year, about uh, 12, 14 months on the boat. And finally, there was dry enough land for them to come out. And when they stepped back onto dry land, God commissioned them, just like he did with Adam and Eve, saying, go out and subdue the earth and multiply and care for the earth and be my representative on earth. This is like creation 2.0. If Adam and Eve was creation 1.0, this is 2.0. Uh, and Noah becomes the new Adam, if you will. Now, Noah... Just to continue the story, to finish it up here, he was, he was grateful to God, he was faithful to God, and he sacrificed an offering to God, and God found it pleasing. And he said in his heart, uh, never again will I curse the ground because of human beings. Even though every inclination of the evil, of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So this is a big moment in the humankind God relationship. Uh, he, he, he makes this very specific promise to Noah that he will not, uh, he will not once again destroy the earth and all of humankind and animals. And he also says to Noah, extending the Adam and Eve covenant, he says, now you may also eat from the flesh of animals as long as they don't have lifeblood in them because lifeblood is a really important theme to God, an important thing for God. And so the sign of this promise to Noah, as we all know, again, from childhood and church is um, the rainbow. And so the text tells us that when God looks down upon the earth and he sees the rainbow, which I'm pretty certain is every day, is somewhere on this earth, he remembers his promise to humankind to never destroy us. So this is the story of Noah and God, this very long relationship that they had. Of course, Noah's relationship with God continues on as long as he is alive. But we get to see some very interesting, specific things about God that tell us many things about him. So what do you think of that story? I think it's an amazing, an amazing story. It has all kinds of fantastic things involved in it, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's probably 50 threads we could pull upon for this story. I mean, uh, we don't have the time to do that. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a, a few things as you were reading that that really stood out to me. Um, uh, probably the biggest thing that I, uh, the idea that Noah is not perfect, right? The idea that Noah just wanted to walk with God, right? And uh, that seems very attainable, right? So if you take this, these stories and say, what does this mean to me right here, right now? It's like, man, just the yeah. desire to walk with God. Like that's all God's looking for. You look through all the heroes of these stories we're going through Noah and we'll continue on through the, the course of the series. It's not like these are men that are, they're not Christ. They're not Jesus. They're not blameless. They're not sinless. They just have a desire to be with their creator. And that, that feels attainable to me, right? Like that, that doesn't feel too lofty for me that I like how approachable that is. Now you couple that with, it seems like if you have that, what's, what's God do? He asks Noah to build this. Like, what do you think Noah's reaction was when he's like, I want you to build this thing. And he sees these dimensions. He's like, what? 
Like, there's no way he's like, oh, no problem, right? And I often feel, I mean, I'm, this may be a little Sunday school but I, I often feel that in my life. Like, all of a sudden, you're walking with God, you're doing this thing, and then you feel like you're supposed to do this thing that's like, what? Like, what's going on here? Why, why? This doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't understand this. And I think that it, the story reaffirms to me, like, when you are a tree in the forest, the forest doesn't make any sense. But that's where faith has to come in and just remind you of this in g- ginormous story that Noah was a part of. And guess what? You and I are part of the same story today. It's still progressing. So um, I love uh, the other thing that I love about this process, again, is just being reminded of all the details and the nuance of 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 these things. And some are very easy to understand. Some of these things are very confusing, but then what do we do? We talk about them. We pray to God about these things. And I think the ultimate purpose of anything we do is the enrichment of our relationship with God. And all of these stories do that. And that's just a beautiful thing. Well, you just said a mouthful there, Jeremiah. Um, (laughs) uh, Well, let's unpack what you just said, which is when you talk about, first of all, what is memorable what stands out to you is that it's this one man who God credits as righteous, right? And we've talked about mm-hmm. righteousness, that he's righteous in the eyes of God, not in his mm-hmm. own eyes, but in the eyes of God. And I guess because he is one man walking with God, in that way we can relate to him, right? Like we, we understand that we are in the same situation as Noah. We're, we're walking with God, We want to be considered to be righteous in the eyes of God. And we feel like that's important, right? There's something about it that we highly value. Um, I mean, it's very relatable. Yeah, yeah, it's very relatable because we don't know that we're doing it perfectly. We're we're not sure we're doing it perfectly or even all that well some of the time, but we're trying. And you look at some of the other heroes of the Bible of... um, a Paul or uh, a Nehemiah or these other folks are like, dude, I can't do that. Like what these people are just wild. Like I am not built that way. I can't do that. Noah. I mean, I understand that there's a mechanic of building the ark, but just a guy that wants to be with God that will kind of do the next step. Like I can do that. Like that, that's yeah. reasonable, you know, and that, I mean, and that little piece is what saved the world. Right. Would, would, would cause God to be like, no, I'm going to keep going with this plan. Yeah. I'm going to give it another shot if you will. Mm-hmm. But Noah, we don't really know what his skills are. We can be sure that in that age and time, you had to have skills of a certain sort, of certain sort in order to live and get by. And he had a family. He had sons, so he had help. There isn't any indication that in, when it comes to building the ark that he had additional help. Like mm-hmm. there's no indication that, oh, the community all came together and said, mm. hey, Noah, what are you doing? We, we want to help you. Um, instead, we get this visual of a one man and his sons gathering all this material and then laying it out and trying to put it all together. And not even mm-hmm. exactly knowing whether what was going to happen. Like mm-hmm. his amount of faith that what God told him is going to happen, is going to happen, was going to happen, is monumental. I mean, it's huge. Absolutely. I think so oftentimes, like whether I'm talking to my wife or my sons, of like, what do we do next? I'm like, I don't know, but I know it's just about (laughs) making the next right move, right? Yeah. I don't always have a master plan, but it's like, let's do the next right thing. I think in business, in relationships, the next right thing. And Noah clearly portrays that. Now, And now I've got a question for you. There is that line that it was interesting. It stood out to you and it stood out to me and you and I haven't talked about it, how it Uh-oh. says that God shut them in, right? You, I, I want to, I guess I, in my heart and my thoughts, I kind of think that's probably not the first time God intervened, helped out in the process, right? Like God shut them in. What else did God do? The story is unclear, but do you, uh, in your thoughts, do you think that's the only time God helped or do you think he was helping oh, no, I mean, the process? There had to be some miraculous intervention to get the animals there. I mean, let's just talk about that. Uh, You don't really hear anything about Noah going out there and corralling all the pears and checking it off. He's an expert lasso and gets that giraffe in the ark. Yeah, exactly. And let's go to the ends of the earth to find this one animal that lives over here. You know, clearly 
God had to have made that happen. Um, but I do believe that God's hand was in it, and he was probably in regular communication with Noah. It's not detailed, but as we see with others like Abraham and Moses, um, he had a consistent conversation, a consistent relationship. And he's having a relationship with Noah too, to help achieve what is his plan, ultimate plan for redemption. Uh, and in this case, it's first to save humankind. Next, it's to pick one man by which to create the lineage of the savior of the world. And then there's Moses who makes certain that lineage doesn't go extinct. And then there's David. I mean, it all boils down to the coming of Jesus. Um, and Noah and Jesus are related. So mm -hmm. it is through Noah's lineage. If you think about it, of course, Adam and Eve's lineage is there because of um, <clears throat> Noah. But Noah's lineage carries the weight going forward for mm -hmm. the birth of Jesus. So, yeah. So my reaction to it is uh, the shutting in was God's protection. Like mm -hmm. now that it's done and now that it's sea worthy or water worthy <laughs> and all the animals are in there, I'm going to make sure you're okay because I'm going to mm -hmm. unleash so much water. You're, it's going to be shocking and amazing all at one time. And I want you to be safe. So I'm going to put you in and make sure you're safe. So I, I want to get to your point about doing the right thing, the next step, how, mm -hmm. uh, how Noah said, I'm going to take this step. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what God told me to do. And mm -hmm. we are called to do that all the time, right? What is God's will for our life? And what would a step in that direction look like? So in that way, we're a lot like Noah, but in other ways, we are not like Noah. And how are we not like Noah? What are the ways that we're not like him? Well, there's a lot, right? I think the first one that comes to my mind is just the faithfulness. Like, yeah. am, I, am I continually faithful to the things that I'm supposed to be without distraction, without, like, would I see a plan through over the course of a long period of time to build an ark? Mm, probably not, you know? Well, what if God was talking to you along the way? What do you think that would be like? Like I don't know. I mean, because like I guess you could, because you could argue. Like again, when 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 uh, Christ had the Last Supper, he said, "I'm sending the Counselor, and the Counselor will actually be better than me, and he will live with inside you." Like Noah didn't have the Spirit, right? So, do we have access to that? Do we not? I don't know. Well, like, the Triune Godhead was in existence at the time of God, at the time of Noah. Mm -hmm. So, although we don't have a specific reference to Noah being filled with the spirit, we can assume he was filled with the spirit because of his zealousness to do what the Lord wanted him to do and his fervor and his ability to keep going. As you're saying, mm -hmm. there had to be all within him, this understanding that this was his mission in life. This was the most important thing he could do. Uh, and, and he stayed true to it. Mm -hmm. I guess the call to us is that we need to stay true to it, but God doesn't call us to do the same thing that he called Noah to do. Mm -mm. Well, I think that's the... Um, In terms of I the think? scale, like the boat, the <clears throat> yeah, scale. The scale. Not like He calls us to be as uh, zealous for him and to be as faithful, but he's never asked me to build something that I wouldn't have any idea how to do it. Like, you know, step out that big. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, to go back to your question, I guess the answer that I would give is I would hope that I can see myself the way that God sees me and I would follow through. I would, if that communication, I would do his plan because I know God sees a version of me and wants to make me into that version that would do those things. And yes. I hope that I continue to become that person. Um, when that's now or then or however that process is that I continue to listen to that still small voice that I continue to make the next right move in my faith walk with him and also uh, understand the challenges in front of me. But again, that's, it also feeds back into the idea that the Noah is not perfect. Again, Noah is not a sin. He's not Christ, right? No. He's setting up Christ, but he's not Christ. And, and if Noah, you could probably argue that, <clears throat> or, or the little morsel you could walk away with that if Noah can do it, we can do it. Like, is he that different than us? Probably not. Yeah. I love, I love that 
we can see ourselves in them and it's just the magnitude of the mm -hmm. call and mm -hmm. the commitment to the call uh also i mean we would have to argue the lifespan like he had a lot more time to do stuff you know our lifespan is shorter so our call and actions towards the call and commitment is a bit more condensed like we have to move on it because we're mm -hmm. not going to live 900 years right um, that all begins to change after <clears throat> noah's generation um but you know, Noah isn't sinless, as you said, and we know, you know, in brief that after this all happens, this is kind of an interesting part of the story. Noah, among other things, he plants a vineyard and then he partakes in the fruit of the vineyard. And, you know, he, he takes, he partakes a little too much. Mm -hmm. And this is what is thought to be a sin that Noah did, that he, uh, you know, he was drunk and in his tent. But I have to say, just from a human perspective, that after everything that happened, uh, I might be inclined to drink a little too much wine myself. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I could see the appeal of, okay, this has really been a long deal. But yeah, so he isn't sinless, but he is righteous. So I think we've covered a lot of this. How to, can we relate to it? Uh, let's just discuss for a minute some of these theological things about the key takeaways, because that's part of what we're trying to do is mm -hmm. help people, help our listeners to see some of these really big themes in God's actions. And as I said before, the first one is creation. And I would be interested to know what the listener thinks about the big theological themes of the Noah story. Uh, because there's probably several ways that we, we can go here. Um, obviously, the first one uh, is that we see the theme of God's heartbreak for humanity. Like This is something that troubles God from the very beginning, and it's a human emotion attached to it, heartbreak and regret and sadness so we see this characteristic of god of which we have the same characteristics of these emotions related to disappointment betrayal sadness um, and he feels that way towards us our inclination towards sin continues to be very grievous to god and when we sin we should feel that we should feel that our sin uh, is sad for God and that it, it grieves him. It's not just that we did it and we're sorry, but how does this make God feel? I feel like that's one of the themes. Hmm. What do you see as another theme in here? The It's interesting to me how we have to wrestle with our image of God. Um, because God is, what are facts we know? God created everything. God's omnipotent. God's perfect. All of these, these attributes that are 100% true. And then it's, and then how does that work with, you see him thinking about what's he going to do with this. He comes to one conclusion and then he comes to another conclusion. And it's interesting to see that God has a thought process, right? Yeah. And, and it's at least being communicated his his thinking is being communicated to us through this story. Now, right. I don't know what we can really understand about God, right? But it is fascinating to see, you know, the story of he's walking in the garden. He asks questions, and then he goes on to a period of time later, and it's like he asks questions to, to Adam. He asks questions to Cain, right? And then it, a period of time later, he, he talks like, what are we going to do with this thing? Uh, I need to destroy it, right? And then... Uh, he, he, he in some encounters Noah. It's like, I'm going to save this thing, right? And then he goes from wanting to destroy it to giving us a promise in the form of a rainbow that he will never do this again. So it's, it's, yeah. it, it probably leads me to more questions than answers, but it, it <laughs> is fun to remind myself that God is very complex and he yeah. has a thought process and we are made in his image, right? So some, our thought processes are not his, but maybe some of our ways of thinking are not unlike his, right? I mean, I, I know those, those are synthetical statements, but I think there's something there. Well, he, he gave us attributes 
that he himself has. I would say the one significant difference is that his attributes include being omnipotent and omniscient and all of the omnis. Yeah, Yeah, Mm -hmm. which means that uh, he knew it was going to happen in the garden. He knew that they would choose through free will to disobey him and this Mm -hmm. set into motion everything that happens. And so therefore, none of it is a surprise to him. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he's reacting in a way that would make us think, well, so-and-so did something, so he changed his mind. This begs the question, can God change his mind? A much bigger theological discussion, but we do get some nuances of it here, even in this story about Mm -hmm. how he wants to destroy everybody, but then there's one righteous man. So Mm -hmm. I think to that, uh, it, it, it kind of speaks to another theme that I see, which is his ability to see the content of a man's heart and to connect to a man and a woman who have a heart for him. So the connection he feels comes from the person's heart, and in that heart he finds goodness for those who choose to walk with him and those who choose to do that with their free will which we discussed about Adam and Eve. Um, So I love the fact that that feels very relational. He's not looking at, well, how smart are you? Are you going to be able to figure it out? You know, uh, how close to perfection can you get? He's wanting to know about what do you think about me? Mm. How do you feel about me? Mm. Uh, And are you going to choose to be with me? And I love those are simple questions. Those are questions that we ask many people who we love, right? Um. Absolutely. The, the, the desire for him just to, again, all the, the relationship, the following him, it's reinforced in all these stories. And then it, when we, you know, the links in the chain, as I'm excited to go through this series, as to how it all comes, there's all a plan, and all of these are pieces to the plan, right? And this, right. and Noah lives yeah. in the same timeline as us, right? Like, this isn't some different world or faraway place this isn't star wars this is we're in the same timeline we we are pieces in that chain the timeline of human history right another theme is this idea of covenant which is important here because we see the development of god's relationship with his people through the covenant a covenant isn't just like a agreement it's an agreement of two parties, one who is greater than the other, in this case, God is greater than us, whereas God is providing blessings to the people that he's in covenant with, but also curses if they do not abide by the terms of the covenant. Um, but ultimately, all of the covenants are leading to this thought and this effort by God to say to people, I will be your God and you will be my people. He wants to have this relationship where he is God and we are his followers, we are his people, and he's gonna make that happen in the world through the lineage of these people that he brings forward. Um, And finally, my last comment about it is really, you know, as you've pointed out several times that Noah wasn't a perfect person, he was sinless. but he walked with God and he wanted to walk with God. And that's an excellent model for us. Um, We have the ability to see many of the words of God in the Bible, you know, whether we take advantage of that or not, you know, I feel like we always should be. And I hope that our listeners are doing the same thing, going back and reading these stories and finding our our guide that we have on my website, sandylaws.com about this series on Meet God, because spending time learning about God can only draw us closer to Him, even though we don't understand it all. And I think that's that's for sure that we don't, and neither can we understand it all on this side of heaven. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I probably want to tag on to that last thought that you, that you presented there. Of In today's world, the idea that I'm just going to sit down and pick up the Bible and read is challenging for me, right? Mm-hmm. There's so much going on. There's so much distraction. The book just feels so abstract at times. 
But when I have a structure of like, oh, here's a, a series I'm doing with Sandy, or here's somebody said this, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm interested in this. I'm going to pick it up and read it. And then these stories come alive again. And then at this point in my life, at this age, with what I understand now, I see different things and I ask different questions. And you and I can talk about those things. I can f talk about those things with my wife or my friends. And I, can, of course, can talk about those things with God, right? So I, I think it's important just as you would go to the gym a lot of people are like i can't just work out at home i, I, I got to have a structure right i think that's where like find a sandy laws podcast find this podcast <laughs> yeah. find your website find some other podcast i mean it doesn't have to be this one find some other uh yes, it a does. structure <laughs> it does have to be this one find talk, call sandy talk to sandy <laughs> not everybody gets to have the fun that i do though um uh and, and, and use these things to enrich your spiritual life, right? Because I, 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 I don't think anybody will regret that. I, I, I promise you won't regret that. I promise that too. I, I know that, that God would promise that as well. Any time spent with him is time well spent. And it leads to these really fascinating discussions about these people who are, you know, our, our, our ancestors, our, our, mm -hmm. yeah, our forefathers in terms of our faith. So... I'm very excited about the discussion of Noah, and next we are going to move on to yet another hero of the faith, a remarkable man, somebody who really became the father of not just one, but three faiths in our world today, and that is Abraham. So mm. I'm excited to talk about Abraham and his story next, and I look forward to our time together, Jeremiah, as usual. So thank you very always, much. Always. Thanks so much for hanging out, Sandy. Appreciate it. Sure. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.